In fact, the entire document can never, ever be materially altered. If you alter a document sent to you, even if it's a crappy photocopy, and let's face it, <clears> that they're not big on the quality of their documents. They might send you something nice and snazzy sometimes, but they're more than happy to send you barely legible uh, things in the mail. Frank, did we lose you? Did uh, Frank. Frank drop off? Did uh, yeah. Frank drop off a call? Looks like he fell off for a moment. Uh, you're seeing some of the chat questions. Did you want to answer any of those for us? <clears throat> sure. Uh, uh, I just want to also say that uh, in regards to the obverse and reverse, that uh, the reverse of a document is the spiritual window. In other words, it's it's a, a medium of uh, putting something on the reverse of a document uh, in which to uh, uh, send a, a, a spiritual uh, uh, message back. Uh, yeah, uh, someone was saying about uh, the Sanhedrin.org. I, I have never been to the site, so I, I can't... Uh, uh, I can't give any uh, uh, opinion on it. Uh, the other one is, uh, should I carry a deed pole on my person? Uh, first off, the, uh, the deed pole is, uh, serves several functions, uh, and uh, one of those major functions uh, in regards to the SESA KV in the standing is of competence. Uh, and in that, uh, you'll see that there's a, a section about mis uh, a mistake of uh, actually using their um, uh, their SESTA KV. So basically, is it's something that could be done on a document uh, that's sent to you, and you you put it on the reverse. Uh, now, when Frank comes on, uh, he will speak uh, in detail about this. Yes, he will be able to explain the rule or law of uh, reverse. So, um, hello. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Okay, Frank. <laughs> uh, yes, tele telecommunications. Yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, we were yeah. talking about obverse and reverse. Yes. So, so there's two forms of a of a, of a document. There's the obverse and reverse. And if, if anyone wants to understand this more, we won't read out the canons, but um, in fact, no, we will, because the canons are written to make it easier. <laughs> let me let me call this up. Uh, Brian, would you be able to? Um, Article twenty two is document. Um, sure. We won't we won't go through. Yeah, we won't go through the whole lot. What we'll just do is get down to this. Um, Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. seven eight six. Yeah, seven eight six. All right. Sure. I'll read seven eight six. All documents, whether valid or invalid, have at least one obverse and one reverse with the primary and most ancient purpose of the front or obverse as the window transmitting the purpose and message of the document, whilst the reverse provides the window transmitting any formal reply or rebuttal. Does that make sense to everybody? You understand that that is the ancient form of document. The front tells you something. We want you to go to court. The back is your is is your rebuttal. Don't worry if the back's got writing all over it. That's immaterial. They do that. Don't worry. The back, the reverse, is your window to respond. Keep keep going. Thank you. Sure. Uh, an ordinary document is a valid document issued and sealed by an ordinary official person registered in the great register and public record of one heaven and existing firstly as an ordinary spiritual and ecclesiastical instrument and secondly as an ordinary temporal ecclesiastical instrument possessing full living personality. It is the third highest and authoritative document of all. Well, now which one was that one? What, what, what that was 783. Ah, uh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Why yeah, don't I just so, do 779 uh, just to explain what a document is? Yeah, go for it. Sure. A document is a, noti uh, a notional form of spiritual or temporal written instrument of one or more pages with each having a front face or obverse and a back face or reverse. There's only five valid forms of documents, supreme, superior, ordinary, general, and inferior. Cool. So we'll just stop there for a sec. Yeah. So 
Thank you. So what we're saying here with, with these canons is that uh, when you receive a summons, even though they don't tell you, and they never will tell you, you have the right to use the reverse as a window to respond to their claim. Now, here's, there are a range of tricks that they've used over the um, decades and even the centuries to stop people finding remedy. And, and in the present climate, those include things like not paying stamp duty, uh, the, the document not being uh, recognised. One of the classic ones at the moment is the dead can't write. So you can't send them a document when you're dead because then they can say, uh, we've just received, have you heard this before, a dead letter? They've received a dead letter. So when you use the reverse of one of their documents, then you're in fact um, proving that you cannot be dead because you're sending back a document that is already verified. They've sent it. They can't deny a document they've sent you. They can't. It, it, it goes against all their principles of law. What you can't do, as I was saying before I, I lost connection, is do not listen to anyone ever that tells you to alter a document in any way, to sign it, scratch it, put words on it. If you do that, you are giving them documentary evidence of an extreme dishonour. You have lost the case before you ever arrive. Do not ever do that. And anyone that has ever promoted that has either been a complete idiot or a willing disinformation agent for the Bar Association. They can only be one of the two. Because you cannot alter that document in any way without accepting a liability. But this is what you can do. You can get a stick of crazy glue and you can glue something on the reverse. And that's how you overcome the issue of there being writing on the back of a document. And it's how you overcome the issue of changing that document in, in a material way. Now, use crazy glue because uh, you don't want anyone in their system to be able to separate the two and play that game. If they want to do that, they'll destroy their own document and they'll destroy yours and, and they've committed a serious, serious breach, serious fraud. Now, the document we'd like you to send back uh, if you're looking for a remedy, is what we're saying, which is the ecclesiastical deed poll. Now, Brian and Terry, do you think it, it is worth, given there'll be a number of people on the call that have never heard us talk about the deed poll, just to quickly mention where they can view that? Yeah, before. and also, uh, I, I believe because it's uh, on Talk to You, it, it'd be just a good intro as well. Okay. Well, because I, I, I am still very keen, and we've gone over the, the hour now, um, and I was still very keen to um, be able to answer questions, and I still want to cover this area of natural law, divine law, and, and what the whole goal of this is. Uh, uh, what we're referring to is, is um, Article 133 of the Positive Law on One Heaven, and that article goes through and describes the definition of what an ecclesiastical deed poll is. It gives the instruction. In fact, it gives you the precise um, words to be put on it and explains exactly how to use it. So, so maybe this. Can I just do a quick recap of what I wanted to cover? So it might be a second, just to cover what I wanted to talk about in terms of natural law, divine law and the whole gist of what this is, and then we can get into Q&A and we can talk a bit more about ecclesiastical law. Is that okay? Sounds good. Yep, that okay. sounds good, Frank. All right. Um, because we're talking about positive law, I know a number of you may not have had the chance to read or view the canons of natural law and may not even have had a chance to look at the canons of divine law. But I do urge you and ask you, when you have a chance, even though it may come across as gobbledygook, to actually go in and have a look, if you can, but start from the beginning of the canons of natural law. <clears throat> because in that, there is some deeply, deeply important and profound understandings and wisdom where there is a serious attempt to give light and understanding to 
the laws that we may call physics and chemistry and science, cosmology, in the context of life being a dream <clears throat> and that the divine creator uh, is in fact the dreamer of that dream. And I refer to that because it is easy <clears throat> by focusing on this kind of area, being positive law, the laws of men and women, the laws that we make, that we lose sight that those areas of canon law have already been written and exist there. So if we are talking about, for example, uh, the question of relevance or the question of significance uh, to ourselves and to our present situation, uh, we're really only covering a fraction of the law if we don't take the time to view what is already presented to you being the divine law and the natural law, and literally is uh, the divine law and the uh, natural law, all the key natural law that uh, has been researched over 25 years to try and bring that into a summary document. <clears throat> now, why? There's a fourth coming, which is ecclesiastical law, which will be up very soon in the next couple of weeks. But the question then is why? Uh, and what, how? Well, when a man does not assert his rights, he has none. And I've said this before, but it's relevant. When Martin Luther uh, saw the Express Trust Canon being Wilhelm Sanctum issued in 1302, he understood the significance that the Roman cult needed to have some formal objection. Now, his approach was to dismantle the assumptions that they were making. Now, for 490 odd years since he did that, of course, the Roman cult continues to learn, to grow, to find new ways to stay in power, <clears throat> as they're doing next week when all the cardinals, including a number of leaders of Christian groups, will all find themselves in Rome at the same time under apparently different motives. <clears throat> but I can assure you that the extraordinary events of next week have uh, more to do with Rome consolidating and growing and con continuing to find ways to stay in power than any kind of mere culpa and change of heart. So the canon law here is to show without a shadow of a doubt, a superior form of law and to recognise a principle of law that has existed in every civilization from the beginning. It is a definition of law. And that is that unless you object, then you consent. Now, it, it, it's perfectly fine to, to sit out and say all law is fictional, uh, what the Roman cult does is wrong, um, it doesn't really affect me, uh, it's all rubbish anyway. That, that, I don't dispute any of those things in terms of their approach to, to law and creating fiction. But you cannot avoid the fact that if you do not enter the arena, then you give the match to the Roman cult. And this has been the problem. Martin Luther is the only man I know of in the last 492 years that has stood on the amphitheatre clearly, concisely, and given some form of argument to say what you're doing is wrong. And he pioneered an entire protest movement that as we speak next week is coming to an end. It's over. It's lost. There's no Church of England now. It's just a branch of the Catholic Church. So in this time now, I urge anyone that's reading this and, and, and acknowledging this and, and, and seeing this, that if you do not stand, then you consent. If you do not object, then you consent. And if you consent, you are nothing more than a slave. And that is the problem that we face. Too many are happy, happy to be slaves, willing to be slaves, wanting to be slaves. Well, that's why we're here. We're here to challenge and say no. That's the reason for the canon law. So I come back to you, uh, Terry, Brian, and everyone on the call, and, and ask for questions as we, we discuss now um, the ecclesiastical and questions that you, you guys may have and want to ask uh, based on what you've read or what you'd like to hear. So over to anyone that's got questions.